Okay, welcome to Unit 7, Symbolic Logic. Uh, last time in Unit 6, we looked at how to construct a truth table, uh, just in the basic way, how to take a complex sentence and build a truth table for that sentence, adding enough reference rows for the atomic sentences, and then calculating the truth value for the complex sentences. So today we're going to learn about applying this method to uncover different logical attributes of sentences. So we'll be looking at how to use truth tables to determine if a sentence is necessary, if it's uh, impossible or inconsistent, and whether it's consistent. And we'll be looking at whether pairs of sentences or groups of sentences are equivalent to one another, consistent with one another, or um, inconsistent with one another. And then ultimately we'll be using truth tables to determine the validity and invalidity of arguments. So the exercise is going to involve a lot of me working truth tables, but it should give you a lot of useful models for applying these methods going forward. So first I want us just to revisit the method of how to construct a truth table for a complex sentence. So I've got a sentence here for you. The sentence is, if Steve has a new motorcycle, then either a rich uncle died or he stole that thing. Okay, so let's think about how we would construct a, tab a truth table for this. And so the first thing we need to do is translate the sentence into symbolic logic, into sentential logic. And to do that, we first need to um, supply a sentence key or a sentence legend to tell us what the atomic sentences stand for. So I'm going to do that here. So our key, um, and let's see how many atomic sentences make up this complex sentence. So we have Steve has a new motorcycle. That's one sentence. And then we have then either a rich uncle died. That's another sentence. Or he stole that thing. And so these are our atomic sentences. And again, we know that by looking at the verbs and seeing how many, um, what sentences involve verbs and the objects of those verbs. So this first sentence, has, is a transitive verb. So we're going to have a subject and an object there. Subject is Steve. The object is a new motorcycle. Um, and that is this, one of the simplest sentences in this complex sentence that is capable of being true or false. Um, a rich uncle died is a non-transitive sentence. Uh, so it doesn't have a direct object. It's just the rich uncle dying. It has a subject there, also capable of being true or false. And then he stole that thing. Again, stole is a transitive verb. So we have both a subject and a direct object. And um, we know that Steve, uh, what this really means is Steve stole a new motorcycle, right? Since that thing is standing in for a new motorcycle. So we're going to give atomic sentence or sentence letters to stand for these three atomic sentences. So we have here A, which will be Steve has a new motorcycle. We have B, which will be a rich uncle. died. Now, the sentence doesn't specify that it's Steve's rich uncle. That's, it seems to be implied by the sentence. You could, if you wanted to, since it seems to be the intent of the speaker, build that into this atomic sentence and say that the uncle is Steve's. But we're just going to take it as a rich uncle died in this case. And then um, the third sentence is um, Steve stole the motorcycle. Okay. Or Steve stole a motorcycle, however you want to formulate that. Okay. So now we need to construct the truth table for this complex sentence. Oh, actually, sorry, I skipped a step. Let's think about the logical form of the sentence. So we've now identified the atomic sentences. What is the logic, logical form here? Well, um, two logical connectives stand out in this sentence. One is if then, and the other is or. So we need to ask ourselves, which of these is sort of the main connective of this sentence and, and which, um, which connective is sort of in a subservient place in the construction of the sentence? That'll tell us where to put our parentheses. So I think here it's pretty clear, and maybe this is identified by the word either, that the or statement 
is under the scope of the conditional statement, the if-then statement, right? So if-then seems to be the uh, main connective of this sentence. So I think our sentence is going to look like this in a sentential logic form. A, if A, then B or C. And this is our target sentence. Okay. So now we're ready to construct our truth table. And remember, our rule for knowing how many rows our truth table has is to think about the number of sentences and their truth or falsity, their, their true false value, right? We know that there's only two uh, truth values for a sentence, true or false. So what we do is to determine the number of rows is we think about how many atomic sentences there are um, so it's number of sentence letters. Sorry, let me correct that. It is actually uh, our possible truth values. So there are two possible truth values, true and false. To um, the power of the number of sentences. To the number of sentence letters. Okay, so here that would be two to the third power, and what we end up getting that equals two times two times two, and so we get eight from that. So we're gonna have eight rows in this truth table plus the one that sets up our headers. Okay, and so we need to draw this truth table now. So we're going to have to have subject rows for three different atomic sentences and then another, uh, sorry, subject columns and then another column for the complex sentence. Oh, <laughs> interpreted me as drawing a circle. Let's do it like this. Okay, there's our truth table. Now we're going to put um, different lines here to identify our different um, aspects of this truth table. So we know that we need um, we need guidelines or um, uh, uh, target lines for our variables for our sentence letters. So we're going to put those in over here on the left. So we know there are going to be three of those. So one for A, one for B, and one for C. And then these are going to be, again, our reference columns. I'm going to put a thicker line here to indicate that what's on the right side of this line is the sentence itself that we're going to be computing the um, truth values for in different possible situations. And so that sentence goes over here. If A, then B or C. And now I'm going to draw in our reference columns. I'll just tidy up a little bit here. And so that is our truth table for this sentence. And now we need to fill in the truth values. And so remember that for truth tables, for our truth tables, um, we're using one to stand for true. These are our two possible truth values. So one will stand for true and two, sorry, zero 
will stand for the false. Okay, so it's akin to binary, one equals on, zero equals off. Okay, so now we can fill in the truth values for our reference columns. And so remember for our atomic sentences, what we want to do is identify or, or to make it the case that um, for every possible value of these atomic sentences, we have a, a way in which they could be true or false relative to one another, right? So for example, it could be possible that A, B, and C are all true, or it could be possible that A and B are true, but C is false, or it could be possible that A is true and B and C are false, or so on. But a simple way to make sure we've covered all of the possible ways in which those sentences can be true or false relative to one another is to start on the left-hand reference column and fill in are true for those sentences. Okay, so we, sorry, what we do is we take the top half and mark those all as true and the bottom half get false. Then moving over to the reference column next in line, we have, um, we do it in quarters. So we're gonna mark the first quarter with ones to identify the true. And then the second column with zeros to identify the false. And then we'll just repeat that pattern. And then finally, the third column here, um, we would just divide again. So in this case, since the third column is the last column, this is just gonna alternate between one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. But of course, if we had, uh, you know, another call, another sentence in this, you wouldn't get down to one, zero, one, zero, one, zero um, as quickly. You would first divide into halves, then quarters, then eighths, and then get to that if we had four sentences, and so on if you move up to having five sentences and so on. But this is the general pattern you want to follow. So now we have our reference column set up for our truth table. And notice, for each situation, we have a value where, um, we have a value where uh, the different possible situations, how those sentences might be true relative to one another are all covered in this. So the first row, and we can actually number these rows too, you may find that helpful. Sometimes we want to refer to different rows as showing us different things. So this can be a good move. So we can say um, that uh, the first row has uh, is a situation in which A, B, and C are all true, in which Steve has a new motorcycle, in which his rich uncle died, and in which Steve stole the motorcycle. Um, the second row marks a situation in which Steve has a new motorcycle, a rich uncle died, but Steve didn't steal the motorcycle. The third one marks a situation in which he has a new motorcycle, rich uncle died, and he stole the motorcycle. Or sorry, rich uncle didn't die and he stole the motorcycle and so on. So we cover every possible situation, every possible way in which the world might relate to these sentences, right? Every possible way these sentences might be true or false are covered in our reference columns. Okay, so now we want to construct our truth table. So again, um, we work from interiority outward. So the, the, the connectives that are more interior that apply to smaller bits of this complex sentence are going to be um, the connectives that we uh, determine the truth value for first. So here, we're first going to do B or C, and then we're second going to do our main connective, okay? So B or C has the following value. We know that our rule for the disjunctive connective is that so long as any one of the uh, disjuncts that make up that sentence are true, the disjunctive, disjunctive sentence is true as well. So we have here in the first row, both of them are true. And we're using the inclusive or, where uh, or statements are true, uh, even if both of them are true. So this is going to get a true value as well. Next one, we have B being true and zero being false. Uh, so that additionally gets a true because it just takes one of them. And this one is true. And it's only down in the fourth row that we first get a false sentence for B or C. And then uh, the pattern actually repeats again. So we have true, 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 and false, okay? And now what we wanna do is we want to apply our rule for disjunction. So next we're going to look at the disjunctive um, connective, the, the um, if then, I'm sorry, the not disjunctive, the conditional connective. 
So we're going to look at the conditional connective next, and uh, we're going to apply our rule for conditional. So a conditional is true um, so long as it's not the case that the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. So in any situation in which either um, uh, the antecedent is false, so all of these um, bottom rows down here, oops, didn't mean to erase them, but that helps illustrate them as well. All of those bottom, in that situation, our, our conditional sentence is going to turn out true. The only time our conditional sentence is going to turn out false is when the antecedent is true, but the um, consequent is false. And so there's only one situation actually looking at our rows. So remember, we want to look at the values for A here and think, think about how those relate to the value of the uh, semi, the smaller complex sentence that we've already composed, the thing within the parentheses. And so uh, in the first row, again, we get true, true, true. And then the only time we get a false value for this complex sentence is here. And in all other instances, because the antecedent is false, we don't have a counterexample to the conditional claim, if A, then B or C. So in this case, there is one row in which our complex sentence is false, or one situation in which our complex sentence will be false, and that is the situation in which Steve has a new motorcycle and he has no recently departed rich uncles and he did not steal a motorcycle. And that seems to make sense. If someone says to you, if Steve has a new motorcycle, then either a rich uncle died or he stole that thing. And if they say this in complete earnestness, then if you find out that Steve has the new motorcycle just using a you know, convenient payment plan, uh, that is not going, there's, what they said is false in that case. And that's the only situation in which it turns out to be false, right? If Steve doesn't have a new motorcycle, then it doesn't matter if his rich uncle died or he stole a motorcycle. Maybe he fenced it quickly. This sentence remains true. Um, in all the situations where he does have a new motorcycle, however, it had either, it had better be the case that a rich uncle died, that he stole that thing, or that both of those happened. Okay, so what we essentially know now is that this sentence is, a, um, is possible. It is um, consistent, right? It doesn't contain an inconsistency. If it did, it would turn out false in every instance. It's not the case either that this sentence is a, a tautology or that it's logically true. We know it's not because of row four, right? A tautology, again, um, is true in every instance uh, whatsoever, right? But there's one instance where this sentence is false, this complex sentence. So this sentence is not a tautology, okay? Um, but it is a um, consistent sentence. Okay, so we've shown that this sentence is consistent, not necessary, not contradictory, but consistent. Now, Let's look at using a truth table to identify a tautology. Okay, so again, I've already written this sentence in logical form. So the sentence is, um, if both A and B and C, then B. All right, or to put that another way, if A and B and C, then B. Okay, so... For this sentence, I mean, I think just by looking at this, we can see that it's true. I mean, if A, B, and C are all true, then it seems that B has to follow. So clearly this sentence seems to be true in every possible situation. In other words, it's a necessary truth or a tautology. And so, um, but we can demonstrate that too using this truth table. So let's set up A, B, and C. Those are our atomic sentences here. And then we're going to use our same method to identify every possible situation in which these can be true or false relative to one another. Okay, and now we can write in our complex sentence. 
And I'm putting plenty of space here to allow us to construct our columns for our different connectives. Whoops. Okay, and I forgot to put in this bracket. I'll do that. All right. So again, remember we're going to work from interiority to complete this truth table. So our most interior part of this sentence are these deeply embedded parentheses A and B here. So a conjunctive sentence is true if and only if both of the conjuncts are true. So this sentence will be true here, here, um, false here, false here. And again, I'm just looking at the reference columns over here for A and B in this case. All right, so I'm just working my way down. We've had, uh, for the first row, one and once, so they're both true, so that means A and B is true. Second row, A is true and B is true, so A and B are true. But then with all these remaining rows, at least one of our conjuncts are false. So the conjunctive sentence itself is also false, okay? Now here we have another um, conjunctive sentence. So this thing, right, is now going to be conjoined with C. So we're going to look in this row to get the values for one of those conjuncts, and we're going to look over here at row C to get the values of the other. And so remember, we need both of them to be true. So we know this will be true in this instance, and in every other instance, either um, one of or both of the sentences C and both A and B are false, so this is the only row in which the sentence remains true. Okay, now we can use a shortcut here, right? So, you know, if we want, we can, uh, you know, you could even color code to show like interiority, so that maybe yellow is the most interior. Um, we have some sort of blue next, and then ultimately maybe, you know, a red for uh, the last row. And so we're gonna end up on this last row here. Um, and so now um, we can ask ourselves, well, what is the truth value for this last row? Well, what we need to do is we need to look at the blue column. And um, since that is what is the antecedent of our conditional, that's the value of our an the antecedent of our conditional, the truth value. And so we know a conditional is true in any instance in which the antecedent is false. So right off the bat, we know that this sentence is true in all of these instances, right? Because the antecedent marked in our blue row is true. And then we also know um, that, uh, that in this row, right? So in, in uh, row one, again, we can write in our row numbers to help us keep track of this. Remember, rows go side to side, columns go up and down. So in this row, right, even though um, our antecedent is true, our conditional is also true, and that's another situation in which a um, in which a um, conditional statement. I'm sorry. In row one, our antecedent is true, but our consequent is also true, and that's another situation in which a conditional is true. So we're going to mark this one with a one two, uh, and now. Um, looking at this row, which I hope is red, but again, remember guys, I suffer from color blindness, so this could be green or brown. Um, this row is once again going to be um, uh, true in every instance, right? There's no row in which this sentence uh, turns out to be false. So as a matter of the logical connectives that compose this sentence, as a matter of its syntactic structure, um, this sentence must be true in every scenario. So this is a tautology. Okay. So the important thing was we just needed to look at our rows and see if there was any instance in which this sentence turned out to be false. There weren't any, so this is a tautology. And in fact, this sentence is, uh, tauto is tautologous um, in virtue of the structure of the sentence. So it doesn't depend upon the meaning of the sentence. It could be the case that there are some sentences that are tautologies or they're necessarily true because of the meaning of the words that make them up. So consider John is to the left of Sam and Sam is to the right of John. The 
tautologous nature of that sentence depends upon the reciprocal nature of left and right, okay? So you couldn't, in fact, represent the tautologousness of that sentence using a truth table. It's only when the uh, necessity of the sentence follows from the shape of the sentence, the way in which the logical connectives relate the underlying atomic sentences, that you can demonstrate necessity using a truth table. But this one has that property. It is, it is a tautology, and it is a tautology in virtue of its logical form, not its semantic structure. Okay, um, so I want to now look at using a truth table to demonstrate the opposite of this. And so I'm just gonna do this very quickly. So here I'll go ahead and put our row numbers in again. So here again, we have one, 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 zero, 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 zero. 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay, so that's again how we set up our reference rows. And now again, we want to work from interiority. So in this case, we do have a negation symbol, but it's not applied to a single atomic sentence. It's applied to a, um, a, uh, uh, conjunctive sentence, sorry, conjunctive, conditional, consequent, all of these con words start to get sort of mixed up in the head after a while. So it is applied to a conjunctive sentence. Um, and so we're going to translate actually the things that are within the parentheses first, uh, or assign their truth values first. So we have A and B, and so that is going to be true, true, and then false in every other instance. And then here we have A and B again, and we can just copy this, this instance. Okay. But though this first part, uh, this says both A and B and not A and B and C, right? That's what the whole sentence, how the whole sentence reads. Um, but so far we've got A and B translated here, but the, sec the thing that comes after the first, um, the first conjunction symbol is a negated sentence. And it's a negated version of what comes before the conjunction of the first conjunct. So we're actually gonna flip the values here. So this is going to be zero, zero for false, false, and then one, 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 one. Okay, and now, we know that a conjunctive sentence, a conjunction, is true if and only if both of the conjuncts are true. So here we have it being false, here it's 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 false. Okay, and now it doesn't really matter what the values of C are. We're kind of led astray by having to put that C in there because again, a conjunctive sentence is going to be valid or is going to be true misuse of valid the conjunctive sentence is going to be true if and only if both the conjuncts are true and since the one on the left the the left's most conjunct is false in this case this will be false in every instance regardless of the value of c and so our um For this sentence, we get the following as the reference row for the main connective. And, um, oops, sorry. Because of that, we know, because we have zeros in that whole row, we know that this sentence is a contradiction. There's no situation in which this sentence can be true. And in fact, its contradictory nature uh, flows from the fact that it tries to claim that some object is true and, or that some sentence is true, some complex sentence is true, and also that its negation is true. But we know that um, every sentence is either true or false, P or not P. And we also know that no sentence can be both true and false. We're dealing with a, um, we're dealing with a classical logic that has only two truth values and doesn't admit of sentences that are both true and false. 
So in this case, we have contradiction for this sentence, okay? All right, so I hope that's clear about how to work with a single sentence to show either that it is consistent, that it is necessary, that it's a tautology, or to show that it's a contradiction. I now wanna move on to look at showing things with pairs of sentences. So, so the, the, the form gets a little different here in how we're going to do this. We don't have just one complex sentence anymore. We have multiple of them. So in this case, we're presented with the following set of sentences, A or B, if A, then C, and if B, then C. And we're asked whether or not these sentences are consistent. So again, we can see that amongst these three sentences, there are only uh, three sentence letters that compose these three complex sentences. So those are A, B, and C. And so this time when we're dealing with multiple sentences, what our reference columns will contain is every atomic sentence in any one of those complex sentences. So what we have here is A, B, and C. Those are the only parts of these sentences. And once again, regardless of the way these atomic sentences go into making up these complex sentence form or these complex sentences, we're just going to plug our truth values in the same way that we did before. So our reference columns are always going to have their truth values assigned in the same way. So that will be one, 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 zero, 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 zero in this case. One, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, and then one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Okay, and so now, a bit different. Last time when we were dealing with a single sentence, that whole sentence went over here, right? But now we have three sentences that we're dealing with. So what we're going to do, in fact, is we're going to make three different partitions on the right side of our reference columns. Now I'm just going to use the thick line for these as well. So we have one. Oh, I meant to make it nice and straight. We'll do it like this. One, two, okay? So that's gonna be, that's gonna stand in for our three complex sentences. And now we just write those sentences up at the top. So we have A or B, A then C, and B then C. And now we can fill in the truth values for these. So a disjunctive sentence is true whenever at least one of the disjuncts are true. So we're going to look at these two reference columns here and just work our way down. And so we have true, 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 false, false. Uh, for a conditional statement, um, the conditional is true so long as uh, either the antecedent is false or um, if the antecedent is true, the consequent is true. And so for this one, we uh, are going to look at these two reference columns, A and C. And so we know whenever A is false, so that would be these three down at the bottom, this thing ends up being true. So we get one, 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 one there. And then uh, in the instances where this thing is true, what we need to do is look and see whether, if the antecedent is true, we need to look and see whether the consequent is false. And so there's two instances in which we have a false consequent. So we can put zero, zero, and then one, one in here. Okay, and now we want to look at another set of column of um, another set of columns here. So what we're going to do next is look at if B then C. So these are our ah, these are our reference columns. And now we want to see, uh, again, our antecedent rule is in any instance when the antecedent is false, the conditional is true. So we know we get truth for rows two and four and for rows seven, I'm sorry, for three and four and seven and eight. And then for the others, we wanna look at, well, is B true there while C is false? And that's not the case for this one, but it is for this. So in that case, because B is true and C is false, our um, our if-then statement, our conditional statement, turns out to be false as well. And in this row, we get a similar kind of pattern. So the first one is true and the second one is false. Okay, 
So um, are these three sentences consistent? So what is it for three sentences to be consistent or for a group of sentences to be consistent? Well, if they're consistent, they're all capable of being true at the same time. I'm gonna go ahead and put these reference row numbers in. And now let's answer that question. Are all three of these sentences capable of being true at the same time? And it seems that yes, they are capable of being true at the same time. So there are various rows in which all of them turn out to be true. This one, I'll do that in a different color. So that one, they all turn out to be true. In this one, they all turn out to be true. In this one, they all turn out to be true. And that's it. So there are at least three rows <laughs> where these turn out to be true. So it's possible for these three sentences to be true at the same time under some circumstances. So we don't know what these sentences mean because we don't know the, the meaning of the atomic part of these sentences, but these sentences are consistent in virtue of their logical form. Okay, so it's possible for all three of these to be true, setting aside now the semantic underlying value of the sentences. Okay. So what about inconsistency? How can we show inconsistency uh, in a set of sentences? Well, I've gone a little further here and set this one up. So our group of sentences here are B and either C or A, and if A, then B. And it's not the case that both B or C. I'm sorry, it's not the case that either B or C. Okay, so again, Mechanically set up our reference table format. And now uh, work from interiority. So we have C or A. So we know that is going to be true, 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 and false. And then true. False, true, ooh, something went wrong here, hold on, ah, I see, let's go back here. So it's easy to lose track of the reference columns you're looking for, so these are our two, so we have true, here A is true, so um, that's going to be true, here both are true, so it's going to be true, here A is true, true, here C is true, so it's true, in this column, A and C are both false, so that one will be false. And same here, A and C are both false. So that's our uh, truth value for this embedded part of our first atomic sentence. Now we want to look at and, and so um, again, a uh, conjunctive sentence will be true whenever and only when both of the conjuncts are true. So here B is true and C or A is true, so we get a true there. B is true and C or A is true, true there. Here B is false, so we're going to get falses for both of these. And here uh, B is true and C or A is true, so we get another true. And then um, here uh, B is true, but C or A is false, so false. And then the last two, B is false, so we get falses there as well. Okay, so for our first sentence, these are the conditions under which it is true, right? B and either C or A is true whenever B is true um, and either C or A is true, okay? So our question is, is that sentence consistent, inconsistent, or just compatible, uh, I'm sorry, or uh, necessary um, equivalent to these other sentences? And so we can answer that question by looking at these other sentences. So we have if A then B, here, and so we're going to compute the value for that. So uh, remember, uh, a conditional statement is true 
uh, in any instance in which the antecedent is false, so this is going to be true here, 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 and here. And then in the other instances where the antecedent is true, we need to look at the conditional is true as well. It's not in that case, not in that case, but it is in the other two. Uh, and then finally, we have B or C. So we start from B or C. Uh, we get true, 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 false, because in this row, uh, B and C are both false. And then uh, true, 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 and false again. Okay, so now we want to know if our sentences are inconsistent. And so what does it mean for a set of sentences to be inconsistent? Well, it means that they can't all be true at the same time. And, oh, <laughs> sorry, I uh, made a mistake of not filling in the last row here. So look at this, uh, I forgot the negation in this case. So we need to do that. So uh, we're going to negate just everything that's in this column. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so now we want to see if there are any rows in which uh, these things, put a little square around that one. Oops. We want to see if there are any rows in which uh, all three of these are true. If there are, then it's possible under some scenario for these all to be true. In other words, they are consistent. But um, in this row, they aren't all true. This one is false. So sorry, let me write in the numbers here. We'll just be very clear about this. We'll write no or yes for each one of these um, as to whether they uh, are all true in that case. So looking at row one, they're not all true because the third sentence is false. So we're going to put an N there. For two, they're not all true because the middle one is false. So no. Um, for three, they're not all true because the first one is false. For um, four, more than one is false. For five, the last one is false. For six, the first one is false and the last one. For seven, um, we see that two of them are false and for eight, two of them is false as well. So for in every row, um, there is at least one of these sentences that is false. So according to their logical form, regardless of the underlying meaning here, we're abstracting away from the underlying semantic structure or the underlying meaning of the atomic sentences, just given the form of these sentences, they can't all be true at the same time. So these sentences are inconsistent. So inconsistent with one another. I didn't put in an example here to show you uh, whether a set of sentences are equivalent. So, what would you think it would mean to say that a set of sentences is equivalent? Well, instead of looking to see if there's any instance in which uh, they can all be true, as we do for inconsistency, whether there's one row where they all turn out to be true, if we do find such a row, then they're not inconsistent. If we're looking for equivalence, we want to see if their truth values ever come apart, right? So what we actually want to see is, is there some instance where um, these sentences have a different truth value. So it doesn't really matter what their truth value is. What does matter is that they always have the same truth value in that instance. And I'll, I'll put a, a short little video up later showing you um, using truth tables to test for equivalence. Okay, so I want to finish up now with a couple of examples of uh, using truth table methods to think about arguments, okay? So I'm going to give you an example to show that an argument is valid and to show that it's invalid, okay? So remember, what is it for an argument to be valid? Well, if an argument is valid, then it's not possible for its premises to be true while the conclusion is false. And in cases where this feature flows from the syntactic structure of the sentence and doesn't depend upon 
the special meaning of the atomic sentences that compose it, we can demonstrate the validity of an argument by showing that anytime the premise is true, the conclusion is also true. So we're going to do that in this case with this simple argument, which has only one premise and a conclusion. So here's our premise, A or, um, sorry, either A or uh, if B, then A. And then our conclusion is, it's not the case, if it's not the case that A, then it's not the case that B, okay? And so we'll put our truth values in here. In this case, notice we only have two rows. So we get one, one, zero, zero for A, and then one, zero, one, zero for B, okay? Now, again, we work from interiority for our complex sentences. So we have if B, then C is the interior part. And we know that this sentence will be true in any instance in which B is false because it's conditional. So it's true there and there. And then um, in any instance in which B is true and A is also true, it will be true. But in an instance where B is true but A is false, this, um, oh, I'm sorry, I put in zeros before for these values. They should have both been one. And then in any instance in which uh, B is true but A is false, we get false for this conditional. Okay, so this is everything that's in the parentheses. That's its truth table. Um, and then we want to think about the relationship between A and this thing. And so uh, if A is true, then uh, we, we just need, for a, uh, for a disjunctive statement, we just need one of the disjuncts to be true. So in this first instance, well, actually in all three of these instances, our complex interior part of the sentence is true. So we know that this is going, this disjunctive statement is going to be true in all three of those instances. What about row number three? Well, in row number three, uh, we have a uh, false right-hand disjunct and also a false left-hand disjunct. And so this is going to be false in this instance. All right, now we move over to this side, our conclusion, and we want to see when our conclusion statement, under what conditions will our conclusion statement be true? And so we have here, um, if it's not the case that A, then it's not the case that B. So what we do first is just calculate the value for these negated sentences. That's the simplest part, the simplest complex part of the sentence. So we just flip the values from their reference tables. So we get 0, 0, 1, 1 and zero, one, zero, one. And then we are going to do, um, then we are going to uh, calculate the conditional. So in a conditional again, if the left-hand side thing is false, then the conditional itself is true. If the left-hand side thing is true, then the right-hand side thing, if the antecedent is true, then the consequent has to be um, true as well. So in this case, we'll get false, and here we will get true. Okay, now what we want to do to assess validity is to look at the relationship between this sentence, looking at its main connective, and this sentence, looking at its main connective. And so we want to see if there's any situation in which the premise is true, but the conclusion is false. If there were, then this would be an invalid argument. But in fact, we don't see such a thing in row one. Um, this sentence, the uh, premise is true and the conclusion is true. In row two, the premise is true and the conclusion is true. In row four as well, the premise is true and the conclusion is true. The only instance in which our premise is false is row three, but in that instance as well, our premise is true. And anyway, it wouldn't be a counterexample if the premise were true and the conclusion is false, because we know that a valid argument can have a false premise but a true, true conclusion. Um, I'll show you what it looks like, however, when we have an invalid argument. So I'm going to do this with this argument, and this will be the last truth table we'll be talking about here. So I'm going to assign truth values to this thing in the usual way. Okay, now we have A or B, so we get true, 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 false, 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 false. 
B or C, which is going to be true, 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 false, uh, true, 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 false. And then not A, so we're just gonna flip the truth values for our reference column for A. So we get zero, 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 one, 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 one for false, 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 true, 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 true. Um, and then finally B and C. And so for this one, we get true, false, uh, false, false, true, false, false, false. Okay, so writing in our reference, our row numbers here. What we end up with is we want to look for any row in which the premises are all true, but the conclusion is false. Uh, that should not be possible uh, if an argument is a valid argument. So do we have any such row? Well, yes, we do. The problem is that I filled in the truth table incorrectly over here, so let me fix that. Um, so A or B is true in any instance in which A is true or B is true. I got a little ahead of myself and looked just at A over here. Um, so in fact, this one, we get the following uh, as true as well. Okay. So um, what we want to do is look at the premises and see any instance in which all of our premises are true. The first row is they're not all true. Second row, they're not all true. Third row, they're not all true. Fourth row, they're not all true. But in the fifth and sixth row, they are all true. And so we might just identify those as being the rows that are of interest to us. Okay. Uh, that's the only row where all of our premises are true. Now we want to see if in that situation, when they're all true, is the conclusion always also true? And it is true in row five but not in row six. So row six presents a counterexample to the validity of this argument. This is not a valid argument. It's possible for the premises to all be true while the conclusion is false. So that's our definition of invalidity, and this argument is invalid. Okay, that's it for today. And um, I will be putting up a quiz on the two lectures later today. I'll also put up a short video where I show you how to construct a, um, how to construct a truth table for two equivalent sentences and how to determine if they're equivalent. Um, but that won't be on the quiz itself. Okay, and I will see you tomorrow for group work.